My name is Peter Pinciaro. I'm the director of the Crane Estate for the Trustees of Reservations. Um, I'm, the, I'm actually the longest serving trustees employee, 39 years. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm so proud to be able to have worked for an organization that's protecting wonderful spaces uh, for all of us around the state for all, all of this time. 118 at this point, and um, we're nestled here in what I believe to be the best of the 118. We've got a long history of protecting the barrier. Um, we made we made really our greatest strides back in the 1980s with the help of some amazing volunteers and and uh, nationally uh, recognized experts in barrier beach management. Um, we, we brought in a fellow by the name of Paul Godfrey, um, a coastal geologist out of, out of UMass, along with a grad student uh, of his, Lars Carlson, and they 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 evaluated our our operations um, the way the way our staff behaved on the property, the way visitors behaved on the property, and made uh, made some best practice recommendations that um, have been in place to this day. So when the when the when the work began, there were there were many many ways that you could get out onto the beach. Uh, all sorts of uh, small trails and large trails over the over the primary dune uh, that was critical in protecting you know uh, our our. Our built environment, our parking lot, and our buildings, but uh, we also were seeing a great deal of dune migration uh, back into the pitch pine forest and some of the really rare maritime habitats here at Crane. So, so we recognized that we needed to uh, we needed to change. Um, the, the Crane Estate, even back then, you know, saw upwards of you know 200, 250 thousand visitors a year. So, all of those human impacts uh, re really can have a significant negative effect on a, you know a, a landscape that's just fragile and, and unique as uh, as Crane. So, I, I, I remember the days before we put the rolled boardwalks in. Um, we, we, our boardwalks used to be right on the surface of the sand, and of course, over the course of the winter, lots of sand would accumulate from northeast storms and we'd have a bulldozer come in in May and and plow out those uh, those access ways in preparation for us to put the the rolled boardwalk down really kind of defeating the purpose of what the the primary dune is meant to be so that was one of the first things that we changed after after dr. Godfrey arrived on the scene and we we went to a series of elevated boardwalks and we dramatically reduced the number of access ways to the beach the same held true for vehicles there were several ways out onto the beach that you could drive a truck we had 30 plus barrels uh, positioned around the beach to collect trash. Uh, we did, did you know, lots of uh, truck patrols back in those days. Uh, so the other big step was just to create one vehicle access point. And we actually had a, um, a, a vehicle ramp that we built that I think Dr. Godfrey had seen out uh, on the Outer Banks uh, down in the Carolinas. So, so we gave that a try as well. The idea being as that primary dune grew, we would be able to lift this ramp up, shake the sand out of it, and the dune would uh, would grow with it. So that was probably uh, m maybe the one technique that didn't work quite as well as planned, but you could still see remnants of that uh, in place today. The other steps that we took were associated with uh, 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 nesting shorebird habitat. So we, we started um, protecting habitat before the birds actually, actually arrived. So it, 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 there were two benefits there. So we were not only protecting habitat and, and you know, uh, re really assisting plovers to thrive here. And we've probably, I think we've got the best program in the country at this point uh, protect, to protect the piping plover. But all of that habitat fencing also separated pedestrians from the primary dune. So that goes up early in the season. Um, and um, it, it, it has largely resulted in people respecting it and not um, and not climbing into the dunes off of designated trails. And uh, you know there are so many wonderful things about uh, the trustees and the kind of people who are drawn to them, and so many wonderful things about visitors here at Crane. I think people are really passionate about the place. They understand its unique uniqueness and want to help us to ensure that it's here um, for future generations. And and um, it's it's really gratifying to see oftentimes three generations of families out, out on the beach um, um, you know, with grand, grandparents who had brought their kids to the beach and now they're with their kids when they bring their, their ch children. So it's really quite wonderful. The third big step was um, managing the deer population. So back in the 80s, deer were Deer were uh, were really over uh, they they were overpopulated here at, at Crane. We had several hundred deer on um, you know 
about 2,000 acres. A lot of that 2,000 acres isn't great deer habitat, a lot of it's salt marsh. So we're seeing some really dramatic impacts on, on the habitat. So, so we, we implemented a, um, a science-based deer management program. Um, and we discovered that, that there were so many deer that they were literally destabilizing the barrier by eating beach grass and, and lots of plants that would not normally be in their diet. So, um, so, so as the deer population came down, um, we really saw the habitat bounce back. And if you take a walk on the dune trails here, um, you can look into a really rich understory um, in the pitch pine forest and some of the, some of the little maritime swales. That was non-existent before we uh, started managing habitat. So that was a, it was a, a huge lift for the organization. I think a, a, a major investment in infrastructure and staffing. Um, also a challenge to change old habits um, for staff that had been around for a while thinking that they sort of knew everything but I think another another great trait of trustee staff is that we tend to be open-minded and and embrace change and that's really what's uh, what has led to so many successes here at Crane. Right over my right shoulder here, um, you can see how successful we were at eliminating what was a, a very wide pedestrian and vehicle access point um, you know, through the early 80s. Um, that, that, uh, that habitat's completely restored and there's a well-established uh, bed of woolly Hudsonia over there or, or, or beach heather. Um, so it's, it's remarkable how resilient um, the, ba the barrier is when, um, when left to act uh, on, on its own. And then out here towards the ocean, to, uh, to my left, we probably have gained about 150 feet of, uh, of ocean, oceanward dune uh, between you know, today and, and 1984, 80, 85. So um, just by virtue of, of establishing the habitat fencing, um, we frequently will also fence the, the latest uh, high tide line from the winter storms because oftentimes there's lots of, there's lots of uh, beach grass that's been uprooted elsewhere in it and that helps the dunes to, uh, to continue to advance. So sometimes at high tide our, our visitors um, and, their, and their blankets are a little bit squeezed but um, uh, fortunately we have uh, two miles of oceanfront here so that people can, people can spread out some and it's really resulted in um, a, a rather dramatic increase in the amount of um, you know barrier barrier beach and, and dunes in between um, in between not only our facilities but also some of the really unique habitats um, out on the center of the peninsula. It can be difficult to balance those things. Um, you know, it, in in many ways, the the beach, the unvegetated beachfront, um, has almost un, unlimited unlimited capacity. Um, but I, I I think our approach has been to pri prioritize the resource first, and and you know how many how many visitors can we accommodate, and in what ways without having a negative impact on the resource. So, so that's been our, our approach here over, over so many years. And we can have on a busy summer day between four and 6,000 people on the, on the beachfront and the habitat is largely protected. I mean, you, you, you very seldom see people off trails in the, in the dunes, very seldom see our visitors up in the dunes. So, um, um, you know, we've, We've really, as an organization, I think statewide, and you can see it from from site to site, whether it's our vineyard beaches or so, you know some of our our, our lovely farms and and um, forests around the state. Um, you know, we 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 like nothing better than than to have people you know come and and enjoy our our sites for renewal of the spirit, and it's consistent with um, uh, the thoughts of our founder Charles Elliott. Um, but we we always err on the side of protecting the resource first. My story um, goes goes way back into the late '60s. Um, I spent a lot of time summers with my cousin, who uh, lived up in Amesbury on the Merrimack River, and he was uh, he and his family were wa water rats, so so they were big, big boaters. And um, my first experience at Crane was actually in the Castleneck River on on the back beach. They they called it going to Essex. Um, back then so we'd, we'd come down the Merrimack and then across the face of the beach and anchor up and there were you know very few boats back in the late 60s.
it's definitely hard to pick one. Um, you know, different different times of day. Um, some spots are are um, more special than others. You know, the magic hour at uh, at sunset uh, is is fantastic here, particularly after the front goes through, and almost. Uh, Almost any place could be your favorite spot on a day like that. Um, it's wonderful to be completely immersed in the silence of the dunes. It's very seldom that you can you can go to a place nowadays and literally hear nothing at all, and that can happen in the dunes. So I've got a couple of favorite spots out there, but my 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 uh, my number one favorite spot would be out at the Crane Wildlife Refuge on Chode Island. Um, if if one walks behind the Chode House up the hill towards um, uh, Cornelius and Manet Crane's gravesite. Uh, there's a point at about halfway up where you, where you can turn and face the sea and look to your left and see the, the, the Cornelius Crane's white cottage, the early 19th century barn, and the Chote House in the foreground, along with the, the entire Castle Neck, uh, the Essex Bay estuary, and uh, uh, the Tippecate Band. So, so that would be that would be my favorite spot.